All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank everybody for uh, joining us here in the uh, West Virginia and Regional History Center. Um, so part of the reason to bring everybody up here was to showcase the center. Um, not only what we have in the Pearl S. Buck collection, but in general, some of the other collections that we have that people who are interested in uh, Appalachia history might be interested in taking advantage of. I'm Melanie Page. Uh, I'm the Associate Vice President for Creative and Scholarly Activity, and I am the co-chair with Kirk Judd uh, of the Pearl S. Buck uh, Advisory Committee um, and sort of uh, the stewards um, of the collection. Uh, and John Cuthbert is the chair of that committee. Um, the, what we're going to do for all of the sessions um, is not spend time on introductions. We have bios in your packet um, so that we can get right to the substance of, of what people are, are going to be saying. Um, before we get started today, I did want to take just uh, a second here. We, uh, the advisory committee, um, as part of being good stewards, we want uh, students to learn more about Ms. Buck um, and her contributions not only to literature but to society um, and so we had a writing contest last year um, and we had a high school category an undergraduate category and a graduate student category and so you can read about the winners uh, in the press release that's in your packet but uh, we're honored today uh, to have Chad Cole Chad um, so if we can Chad's just because he's here um, and we thank him uh, and his wife for joining us. Uh, so Chad is from Morgantown. He earned his BA in journalism at Penn State University and then spent the next eight years teaching English as a second language in South Korea. He's currently a graduate student at West Virginia University studying secondary education with an emphasis on English. Upon graduation he plans to work as a high school English teacher. Yay, yay, yay. Um, I have a high schooler. Um, so yay, that we have really smart, uh, great people that are going into teaching. Uh, his entry was titled, entitled The Diner and focuses on Joanna, who hasn't spoken with her mother in many years. When she meets Ying, a mother who is re reuniting with her daughter after a lifetime of separation due to China's one-child policy, Joanna learns one of life's most important lessons. It's a story about life, love, and second chances. Uh, and you can actually win, read all of the winning entries, uh, and the website is at the bottom, so I would encourage you um, to do that. And we, this will be an annual contest, um, and so we will send out announcements so that you can share that with um, the young people in your life. Um, and so we thank you. We welcome you to the conference. Please, if you need anything, please let us know. Uh, thank you to Dean Cawthorn uh, for the use of the library and all of the library staff and all of the event planning staff, Lisa Martin, um, and the university relations has been incredible. Um, and so welcome and we thank you for your time and effort. John, I'll turn it over to you. I'd like to welcome everybody to the West Virginia Regional History Center. I'm just going to say a few words about the center and then I'm going to turn the program over to Kirk. Uh, the West Virginia Regional. Uh, how many people have been have not been here before? Oh wow, that's that's quite a quite a group of people. Uh, the West Virginia Regional History Center is the primary historical archives in the state of West Virginia. We serve the function that's usually served by a state historical society. There is no West Virginia Historical Society, and <clears throat> WVU began doing the sort of things that a state historical society does in its absence back in the 1920s. And over the past hundred years or so, we've built the primary collection of historical information about literally any, any subject that you can think of uh, as it pertains to the state of West Virginia. And uh, it's a huge collection that consists of uh, between 35 and 40,000 linear feet of archival materials, which is the equivalent of maybe a 10-story building with every shelf in the whole 10-story building filled with archives and uh, I'm going to run through. As I say, we have something on literally any program. We get visiting committees from around the university that come in and they, they might be from geology or medicine or botany and we are able to find something that absolutely fascinates them. Uh, a couple of our strongest areas are politics and government. We have things relating to the founding fathers of our country. Actually, there is a 
surveyor's compass that belonged to George Washington in this case, if you have a chance to see that, along with the, uh, the, the uh, original surveyor's compass made by the Rittenhouse brothers that, that basically uh, established the Maryland-Virginia border from the Fairfax Stone to the Mason-Dixon line, if you're familiar with what the Fairfax Stone is. Uh, but in any case, our political papers include the papers of the two fathers of West Virginia and other politicians going up to, including Senator Rockefeller and Congressman Ray Hall. Uh, in all, we have the papers of, I think, two dozen or 25 maybe congressmen, senators, and West Virginia governors. Business and industry is another area of great strength here. We have the papers of the industrial titans that basically built West Virginia's economy during the 19th century, including Henry Gassaway Davis and Stephen B. Elkins and uh, Johnson Newland Camden, who was John D. Rockefeller's uh, lawyer in West Virginia uh, around the time of the Civil War in late 19th century. He really put Standard Oil together for Mr. Rockefeller. Uh, education is also a, an area of great strength. I'm not sure how I got off there, but <laughs> so what, what's going on? We went there? one too far. <laughs> Can you choose it down at the bottom? So John, do you need to uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how did how did we go into? <clears throat> That's a very good question. I was watching. Anyway, I'm going to continue to talk while he's yeah. uh, Civil War is a great area of strength. Actually, we were doing an assessment of the collection recently, and we did a census of diaries, and I believe the total was 88. We have 88 different Civil War diaries, and we have thousands of Civil War letters, uh, a lot of Stonewall Jackson materials. Uh, I'm taking it from the top, it looks like. Uh, we, we are the archives for WVU. We've got. Uh, many hundreds of feet of WVU records and that, that's, we're currently involved in a major initiative to uh, develop the university archives. Uh, the culture and arts, uh, once again we have fabulous collections. We, uh, we've got a super collection of early music uh, of West Virginia uh, including some of the most important uh, American folklorists in the study of American folk song because back in the early 20th century WVU was kind of a leader in, uh, in the country in terms of studying American folk music. And our collections go all the way up to the present. You can see that's a Star Trek. We've got 390 scores to Star Trek Deep Space Nine <laughs> because the composer was a WVU graduate. Uh, this is a drawing by David Hunter Strother, who was really the best known artist reporter in the United States on the eve of the Civil War. And we have close to a thousand drawings by Mr. Strother, along with his voluminous diaries and correspondence. Uh, West Virginia authors is an area of great strength for us. Uh, I, here on this uh, slide, I've mentioned uh, the papers of all the manuscripts of two of West Virginia's recent poet laureates. Also, Melville Davis and Post, who was a leading uh, mystery writer in the U.S. around the turn of the 20th century. David Hunter Strother's materials, Maggie Anderson's papers, short story, Breeze Pancake's papers, Denise Giardina, Stephen Kuntz, if you're familiar with uh, Mr. Kuntz, who writes action novels and has had, you know, dozens on the bestseller list, and the great outdoors writer, George Bird Evans, who uh, I'm not sure how many books he wrote, but it's probably close to a hundred. Uh, he was a mystery writer and also a, an outdoors uh, writer. And of course, Pearl has Buck. And at, on this note, I will turn it over to Kirk. Thank you, John. <laughs> so I'm just going to briefly tell you a little bit about the birthplace itself, its location here Thanks. in West Virginia. Uh, the formation of the Pearl S. Buck Birthplace Foundation, as uh, the owners of the collection how the collection came into our hands, and a little bit about the relationship of Pearl to her birthplace and why, why those manuscripts wound up in West Virginia and why she wanted them to be here. Uh, the house itself is in Hillsboro in Pocahontas County, West Virginia, in a geographical area called the Little Levels. 
It's between the Allegheny front of the Appalachian Mountains and the Greenbrier River Valley. It's a beautiful area down there in Pocahontas County. It was built by Pearl's great-grandfather, Hermanus Stulting, and her grandfather, uh, I'm sorry, great-grandfather Cornelius and grandfather Hermanus Stulting. Uh, Cornelius was the first uh, Dutch immigrant into the Greenbrier River Valley in the 1840s. Uh, it was finished sometime between 1858 and 1875. The records are a little fuzzy from back then, but we know it was finished sometime uh, in those, during those years. It's built in the design of a Dutch city house. It's a, it's a fairly unique architectural style called brick nogging. It's built by red brick walls with wood siding on the outside and plastered wood siding on the inside. So it's brick walls with wood on both sides. It's 12 rooms. It's four rooms dug into the earth lined with sandstone boulders. Those rooms originally were the kitchen and storehouse areas. And four rooms on the first floor, four rooms on the second floor. Those rooms were used for uh, bedrooms, uh, a <laughs> Someone's calling you, Dave. Uh, be <laughs> bedrooms uh, uh, and studies and uh, library slash music room. The Stulting family was very learned and very concerned with the arts. Uh, the craftsmanship of the house is exceptional. The uh, the woodworking, uh, the staircases, uh, some of the other details. The floors were all done of local hardwoods, much of it uh, much of it walnut, which is very beautiful. You can see some pictures of some examples of that here at this conference. And they're, they were hand rub and they're still in pristine condition just as they were when the, when the house was built. It's, the house has been kept exceptionally well. Uh, Pearl's mother Caroline, or Carrie, uh, lived there until her marriage in 1880 to Absalom Seidenstricker. They were missionaries to China. They moved to China to fulfill their mission and came back periodically to the United States and to their home in West Virginia, where Pearl was born in the house in 1892, uh, making her fourth generation on both her father's family and her mother's family in West Virginia. Uh, the house remained in the Stulting family until 1922, when it was sold to a neighbor, George Edgar, and it remained in his hands until the late 1960s. Pearl, uh, as I said, was born in the house, stayed there for three months, and then went back with her parents to China. Uh, she learned of the house through her mother Carrie's storytelling. Carrie must have been an exceptional storyteller because Pearl was inspired by the stories that she told uh, to the point where she felt like she knew what the house looked like, what it was. In fact, she always claimed to have remembered her birth in the house, what it smelled like, what her mother's face looked like, the sounds. And, and she, the, she came to think of the house in America in, in terms of everything that was good about America. In China, around the turn of the 19th uh, century around 1900 was undergoing some great turmoil and in her words she came to think that her house in the United States became the symbol of security and peace in a world where there was neither security nor peace and you can see that influence in throughout her literary career and in her uh, good works and social and culture works um, she returned to West Virginia at Pocahontas County in the summer of 1901 she, when she was nine years old. She uh, stayed in Lexington, Virginia. In fact, she went to the third grade in Lexington, Virginia, which she said was a great waste of time because she already knew all of that. Then uh, she spent uh, the 1902 month of August again in the house and that, that visit had just cemented her relationship with West Virginia, with the United States of America, as her home place. This, this was the place where she identified all of her life as where she was from. Uh, she 
wrote glowingly of that visit and again in 1909 when she returned. But at that point, her grandfather had died. Uh, an uncle had taken charge of the house. She spent the summer there, then enrolled in Randolph-Macon College, which is now just Randolph College in Virginia. And she visited briefly the next summer, went back to China, and did not return to the house while it was still in the family. She did return to the house once again in 1963 during West Virginia's centennial celebration. Uh, ce celebration of statehood. Uh, the birthplace itself was founded as part of an effort. Uh, when Pearl returned in 63 and saw the house, uh, it was being used at that time, I believe, to store hay. And uh, she saw the condition. She, she wanted to buy the house and gift it to the state of West Virginia so the state could make a park or a uh, memorial. That didn't happen to her great distress and to the distress of many people who were familiar with the effort. So a gentleman by the name of Jim Comstock <coughs> took up the cause. Jim Comstock was a newspaper man and raconteur of some renown from uh, Nicholas County, which is just one county over the mountain from Pocahontas County. He organized the beginnings of what eventually has become the Pearl S. Buck Birthplace Foundation. He solicited donations from around the world, finally bought the house and presented it to Pearl in 1965. Yeah. Uh, the foundation was incorporated as a West Virginia 501c3 nonprofit organization in 1968. Several fundraising activities took place, including the writing of the original copy of this version, slim version, called My Mother's House. Pearl wrote mm -hmm. this specifically for the foundation uh, sold them, they sold them at uh, $100 for donors to the foundation back in 1970s. Uh, she had other book signings to support the foundation. The West Virginia Federation of Women's Cubs became a sustaining partner. Uh, and in 1968, a $100,000 grant was obtained to begin restoration on the house and grounds. Uh, Attorney Robert Jacobson was the first volunteer director of the foundation. Uh, he was succeeded by Dave Corcoran, the first paid director. Dave is here with us today and is now back on the board of the foundation. Uh, the house was put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1970 and opened for tours in 1974, a year after Pearl died. After nearly 50 years, the foundation continues to function as the owner of the manuscript collection and the overseer of the birthplace and the grounds. We're governed by a 12-member board, uh, of which a five-member executive board does the day-to-day -day operation of the organization. Uh, during the summer months, the house is open for tours. Uh, we have uh, conducted by on-staff tour guide. Uh, our tour guide is also here with us today, and she will be going on the bus trip Tuesday with those of you who have chosen to go visit the birthplace to give you a, a, an in-depth tour on your journey down there. Currently, we have no staff or director or, or permanent office. We are seeking new sources of funding and new partners. If any of you have any ideas or want to volunteer, please see me sometime during this conference. As part of the idea to fund the foundation, an idea grew to, to leverage Pearl's manuscript collection. At that, that time, they were all in storage in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Pearl was also a prolific writer, like George Bird Evans. She's most often credited with 85 books, probably closer to 100. Um, in, in the fall of 68, Mr. Jacobson met with Pearl to discuss forming the foundation and his service as, as director. In 1970, a seminar was held at the birthplace sponsored by West Vaco, the lar then the largest landowner in West Virginia and a large lumber company in the state. And several prominent folks from around the state spoke. Uh, at that point, Pearl sat down and autographed 300 books to, to be uh, sold for the foundation. 
Some of those books are here at this conference today with Pearl's autograph, and they will be for sale in the Erickson Alumni Center during the conference. Uh, on October 15th, 1970, Pearl and Mr. Jacobson uh, signed a bill of sale conveying the manuscript, her entire manuscript collection to the Birthplace Foundation for $1. Uh, the next day, they attended a board of the Pearl S. Buck Birthplace, Pearl S. Buck International in uh, Philadelphia, or near Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, to announce the sale in the fall of that year Pearl went on a statewide promotional tour, statewide in West Virginia promotional tour to promote the foundation and, and the uh, beginnings of restoration, restoring the birthplace. In 1971, Pearl became terminally ill. In 72, Dave here visited with Pearl and, and Danby and discussed the collection and long-term plans for the foundation. Uh, and unfortunately, she died in March of 1973. In April of that month, uh, later that month, uh, the, the affidavit was, I'm sorry, in April, uh, Dave and members of the PSBBF wrote, drove to Pennsylvania to make a claim on the collection under the terms of the sale. In October, Dave himself drove the truck to Boston to pick up the, the collection and delivered it to West Virginia Wesleyan College to be delivered into the hands of John D. Rockefeller IV, who was then the president of that institution. Uh, it, was, uh, collect, it was placed in the Annie Mur Murner Pfeiffer Library on campus, and there it remained until 2014 when we formed the advisory committee and the partnership that uh, Melanie spoke of with John Brett Miller from West, uh, West Virginia Wesleyan and the Birthplace Foundation to move the collection here. <laughs> Does that mean my time is up? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the agreement was announced in, here on campus in October 2014. One, one salient point, the manuscript of, the original manuscript of The Good Earth is not with the collection. It was not with the collection when the, the Pearl S. Buck Birthplace Foundation took possession of it. It was uh, surfaced in 2007 in an antique mm -hmm. shop in Philadelphia. The FBI confiscated it and returned it to Pearl's estate instead of to the Birthplace Foundation. Uh, so that is a brief background. What our mission is, both the foundation and this uh, partnership agreement, is to realize Pearl's dream to make her birth base become a gateway to new thoughts and dreams and ways of life. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brett Miller, who will talk about the life of the collection at West Virginia Wesleyan. So as Kirk says, my name is Brett Miller. I work as the college archivist and music librarian at West Virginia Wesleyan College in Buchanan, which is about an hour south of here, due south. And West Virginia Wesleyan was privileged to be the, uh, we'll say, custodians of the collection um, in what was to be a temporary arrangement that then lasted almost 40 years. Um, <laughs> so, and, and much of that history and, and the reason that the manuscripts came there was because of uh, Senator Jay Rockefeller at that point who had been elected president of West Virginia Wesleyan. He was coming off of a gubernatorial loss um, in West Virginia, uh, but he was interested in remaining in the state. And so he found um, a, we'll say, a a landing spot in Buchanan as the president of West Virginia Wesleyan in 1972. Um, the manuscripts made their way here from Boston and were delivered and, and accepted in a ceremony in 1974, October of 1974. Um, those of you familiar with West Virginia art, um, Charlie Harper uh, actually spoke and gave the address at that, at that event. Um, again, as I say, the Wesleyan was only ever meant to be a temporary facility. Um, at that time, we did not have an archivist on staff. There was um, part of the impetus for this. There was, and I will show you in the next slide here, um, an impetus in terms of the facility and that our library had been added to. Uh, the building was built in 1950 to 53. It was opened in 53. Um, and as the collections were moved in, we immediately ran out of space. And so um, it was only 20 years after the building uh, was first constructed that it was um, needed to be uh, expanded 
for uh, the ability to accommodate our collections. And so part of that allowed for the impetus of the collection coming here. Um, as also mentioned, Pearl did make a statewide tour. These are pictures of her, if you can see, um, accepting the Rhododendron Award, which is one of West Virginia Wesleyan's highest honors. Uh, but this was also part of her promotional tour around the state, and so she spoke in Wesley Chapel and um, made this a stop. As I mentioned, the wraparound construction was uh, completed in 1972, and that allowed for us to accommodate the collection, um, as the original agreement noted, in a fireproof room that was climate controlled. Um, I'm not sure how fireproof anything truly is, but it certainly was kept safe uh, for the better part of those 40 years. There was some basic processing work done to the collection while it was at Wesleyan. Um, as I said, we did not have an archivist at the time, but we did have um, a core of uh, dedicated volunteers who were um, both, I would say, loyal to Pearl and interested in the, the well-being and the, the um, accessibility of the collection. And so uh, Mary Lee Welliver is one, um, and Lucille Zinn was another uh, who worked on processing the collection, getting it into, at the time, what was appropriate archival storage. And actually, Mary Lee Welliver was responsible for primarily cataloging. She got through about 80 to 85 percent of the collection doing an item level inventory um, as part of her master's thesis from West Virginia University. So an interesting little, um, little piece there. As the reality of a, a full research center in Hillsboro uh, sort of never materialized. The collection, because um, I think that was the original intent, was that, that the manuscripts would return to Hillsboro um, to be a resource there. And the, the reality of, of storing them in a, in a house um, down there without adequate facility to, to preserve them, um, as I said, never really came to, to be. And so the collection remained at Wesleyan um, through the 1970s. Um, and into the 80s, there were um, some periods where the access to the collection perhaps wasn't as, as um, easy as it should have been. And I think this is sort of what I characterize as the period of benign neglect. The collection had a lot of fanfare when it was first accepted, and then it became very difficult um, to, to facilitate access, basically. We'll put it that way. Um, there was a very complicated process that was instituted in the 1980s uh, with the board that involved um, with the board of the Pearl S. Buck birthplace. That involved um, getting written permission for any researcher to access the collection. There had to be a board member present while the person was researching. It had to get permission from two or three different people. And so uh, it really did, I want to say, dissuade access to the collection. It became difficult for folks. We did have a few visiting scholars through the early 1990s. Um, but as I said, the collection sort of, um, I won't use the word languished, but it certainly was not very accessible to researchers. And I, um, one of the driving points and why we uh, undertook this effort to bring the collection here to Morgantown was that we knew we were not doing a good service by allowing it to remain locked away. Um, in essence, it was stored in a separately locked room that was not, uh, again, accessible to anyone else outside. And so we, uh, we really thought that um, not only was that, um, we'll say, not a good use of the collection, but it certainly wasn't helping Wesleyan in any way either. And so. Um, we, we did have an interesting incident. I like to tell this story about um, the director of Wesleyan's library who woke up one morning and was checking the news and saw Pearl Buck manuscript stolen and found recovered in Philadelphia and she had a, a meltdown <laughs> before she realized that it wasn't indeed um, the manuscript of the Good Earth that was not with the collection. But she, she thought what had happened since she had left work the day before. She was not, not very pleased by that. Um, but we are very pleased and, and fortunate to be included in this agreement and, and as part of this collaborative to help, um, again, drive um, more interest in Pearl's legacy. Um, and we are pleased to be involved in the conversations to move the collection here um, to, to West Virginia University. And with that, I'm going to turn this back over to John so he can speak to you about some updates to the collection, things that have happened um, since that time. How do I get back to the other? Yep. So. Brett showed a photograph of Pearl Buck at West Virginia Wesleyan in 1963. I get to show one of her at WVU in 1963. <laughs> and uh, these, some of these things in the background 
are things that I've pulled out and exhibited in various exhibits we've had here, so they all, I recognize those things. Anyway, uh, the West Virginia and Regional History Center has been interested in Pearl Buck throughout our history, obviously, as uh, the state's most celebrated writer. I, I don't think that's too strong of a thing to say by any means. And we began acquiring manuscripts by her uh, probably in the 1950s. And over the next several decades, we acquired everything that we could find uh, either through donation or actually purchased from manuscript dealers and things like that. And, and prior to us entering the present uh, agreement, uh, we had nine feet, nine linear feet. In, in other words, these things are. Uh, I should have had an example of a manuscript box so that you see the sort of boxes that these are uh, stored in, but it would it would take boxes lined from there to, you know, nine feet. And that's how much material we had. Uh, in this group that we received from the birthplace, I believe there were 38 linear feet of material that came in that collection. So that really is the mother load. Anyway, uh, we had discussions periodically with the Birthplace Foundation about trying to do something to improve uh, access, care, et cetera, to the collection. And uh, I was visited by several uh, of Kirk's predecessors, probably during the 90s and early 2000s, uh, before Ber uh, Kirk ascended to the leadership of the organization and was really determined to make something happen to improve uh, the collection and access to it. And uh, I believe it was probably in 2013 that the foundation decided to proceed by putting out an RFP and, and uh, I don't know, I know it went to West Virginia Wesleyan and it went to WVU. Whether or not it went anywhere beyond that, I really don't know. I think there was talk that it might go to some other archives in the state, not sure if that happened. But in any case, uh, we, we had great ties with the people at West Virginia Wesleyan, and when the RFP went out, uh, we decided that rather than get into a position where they would submit something and we would submit something, that if we could sort of talk among ourselves and come to some common agreement, there could just be one proposal and uh, we were able to get together and negotiate that, and uh, we uh, jointly submitted a proposal to the Birthplace Foundation, which, which they accepted. And uh, I'm going to run through some of the points. I don't know if I'm better off sitting down so that you can actually see the slides. Uh, two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Well, quick. This is going to be a lightning round. Uh, point, point one. The foundation would, would continue to hold title to the collection, but it would name the center as the permanent depository uh, for the collection. Uh, what, what happened? Okay, WVU would uh, accept responsibility for risk management, something that it had not had in the past. So it's now covered by WVU's uh, uh, insurance we would open the collection to research broadly across the world and uh, uh, invest the manpower into cataloging it according to modern practices. Uh, point number four, there would be a collaboration on a variety of Pearl S. Buck collection goals and initiatives by three partners, the three of uh, which are represented here today. The first goal was to create an advisory committee uh, that would be in charge of implementing these goals and initiatives. And this is the list of our current membership, which you see uh, contains a lot of high-level WVU people, people from the uh, Birthplace Foundation, West Virginia Wesleyan is represented, the Pearl Buck International and uh, Percasey, Pennsylvania is represented. We have somebody from d and &E, uh, which has a significant Pearl Buck collection. Uh, so we really have reached out to a wide variety of people in putting together this board. Uh, improve access and care. <clears throat> we physically transferred the collection here in the fall of 2014. We immediately reprocessed the collection, which means going through it, uh, reorganizing uh, and, and, and placing everything in modern acid-free file folders and boxes and creating a 
a new finding aid using modern principles of uh, archival description. Uh, we, goal three was development of a website and we, I don't know how many of you have been on the website, but we've developed a beautiful website that has her biography and a guide to the collection. And this is astronomically uh, advertised the, the existence of this collection. The okay. electronics say time is up. Okay, well, give me give me like a one more minute, please. Uh, we get something. We get like a million hits a month on our website. So this really has brought this collection to the attention of the world. Uh, we have uh, put some money up front to acquiring additional probe materials, and boy, the timing was great because we've acquired a, a lot of great things. We've created grants for visiting scholars. Uh, we have begun the development of educational programs uh, for the community, for uh, students at all educational levels. Uh, we have begun the development of award, an awards program, and, and we talked about the writing awards here earlier. The University Press is hoping to publish Pearl Buck materials. We're working with the uh, Family Trust to hopefully negotiate an agreement to be able to do that. We're going to publish the conference papers, uh, the proceedings of this present conference. And we have a lot of things going with the birthplace where WVU programs will be partnering with the birthplace to uh, implement the, uh, the sort of things on this slide. And finally, the uh, creation of a biannual Pearl Buck conference. And you can see the progress that we've made because you're all here. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a couple minutes for questions. Come on, I made him talk really fast. We have to have at least one question. I want to understand the Boston connection a little bit better. I don't get where, where that's coming from. I, I'm not sure. Dave yeah. might have more information about that, but that's where her manuscript collection was stored. In, in a in, bank vault. It was in Shawmut Bank. But why Boston? National bank. Well, so she, she was, was asking in, Dave, why did why was the she was living in Vermont at the time, and so mm -hmm. probably Boston. I'm just Plus. speculating. Was the yeah it, um, uh, the problem was this? Miss Buck died in uh, March of uh, 1973. So um, then it got into the hands of lawyers. Uh -huh. <laughs> but but why was it in and, Boston uh, to begin with? Oh, it was in Boston because, uh, see, her uh, husband's uh, firm, the John Day Company, was headquartered in Boston. Oh, I didn't so that. he, I <laughs> Richard Walsh, had okay, that makes the sense. manuscripts placed in the Shama National Bank okay. where I picked them up. Thank you, uh, <laughs> President of okay. Hardesty. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I will tell you one story about that, and that was that um, it wasn't easy going up there and getting them and bringing them back because after the argue, the, oh, I will say this: that one of your Morgantown lawyers, John uh, or uh, Cotta George, he uh, graduated from WVU. And he was the one who actually negotiated us getting the manuscripts for West Virginia. They just about didn't come here. Mm -hmm. They didn't come here because uh, when I went up there with a, another fellow that just had a big truck, um, we were, you know, driving off and on from uh, Hillsboro on up there. Uh, we got up there after we got all the manuscripts. We got them in the back of the truck. I mean, it was a van. Well, anyway, this was at the time, 1974, when uh, hitchhikers, hitchhikers were killing people. They were getting rides and pulling out guns and shooting the driver, stealing the car. Well, all at once, this, this other fella stopped and picked up this real ragged, long-haired person uh, who 
said, hey, I want a ride. And of course, I couldn't understand that. But anyway, he gave him a ride. Well, the guy said, I'll sit in the back. Oh, shit. Well, we had these about 10, 12, 15 boxes of manuscripts back there. So I said, I'm going back there too. And all this guy did was he kept looking at those boxes. Oh, he just kept looking at those boxes. And finally he said, what's in those boxes? I said, oh, just a bunch of old papers, that's all. From an estate, that's all. I think he thought it was, you know, gold or silver or something like that. So he said, oh, okay. He shouted up to the driver, let me out. He got out and went. So they about, and then I'll tell you one more when we, we up it was. Huh? We have more questions, Dave. Oh, I, I was never. This, yeah, Dave and I go back to the to the middle 1970s. I, I moved to the Hillsborough area finally and started working there part time in '76. I moved there in '78, and for almost 20 years I lived just a mile from the Pro Bunk birthplace. I was never on the board, but I was always interested in trying to help out. And and I started talking before Kirk was on the board with people at the birthplace and with John and and. Uh, the Wesleyan Library people, and John, man, he wanted those papers so bad he could taste it, <laughs> but he didn't have any way to get it. And so we came up with the idea of let's have an appraisal. And I was able to get a little grant, I think from the Humanities Foundation, and John found mm -hmm. a, an appraiser that he had known, who had done James Baldwin, right? No, uh, Alex, yeah. Alex Haley. Yeah, but he, he, he's done Alex Haley, uh, Martin Luther King, Senator Muskie, Senator he, Byrd. He was the real thing. Yeah, he's way. the real thing. And he agreed to work for just a little bit of nothing and did a totally professional appraisal, which valued the collection that was in Hillsborough at a million dollars. Now, WVU is not a rich public university, but the Pearl S. Buck Birthplace Foundation is a very poor foundation. I mean, they just barely scraped by. Dedicated people, that's all that's got it going. So my idea was, can we get Jay, who was about to go out of office as a senator, to buy, get a special appropriation for WVU to buy the collection for a million dollars, which is what it was worth, and make that a, an endowment for the Pearl S. Buck Birthplace Foundation. Well, that part of it didn't work out, but I, re I really think that part of this conference needs to be talking about the needs of the Pro S. Buck Birthplace Foundation and trying to really help Kirk and BJ, who is the president now, to get the money that's needed to keep this building going and turn it into a real living history museum for the, the Pro Buck fans around the world and the state of West Virginia. One more, one heard, more question. I heard that you had some damage from the flooding to, uh, to the house. No, not, wondering... nothing from the flooding. We actually had some damage from the hailstorm that happened a month before the okay. flood. Right. But we have insurance, it was covered, we're okay. Okay. Uh, and Kirk, also you wrote a grant, right, that helped with the window restoration? Uh, yeah, we uh, we had the half of the windows restored by a grant from the State Historic Preservation Office two years ago. This past year we submitted a grant for the rest of the windows. We did, that grant was approved, so we'll be working on the rest of the windows. The house is freshly painted, new roof, and it'll have all new windows. So it's going to be in great shape. I was just wondering if you could talk about um, the movement of her father's house to the property. In 1982, uh, two women who owned, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have their names, but who owned a property in, near Ronsifert, West Virginia, which is down the Greenbrier River, about 40 miles, 45 miles from the birthplace, where Absalom was born. Absalom Seidenstricker was born in this, the cabin was built around 1834. And they had it moved, taken down, uh, and reconstructed on the birthplace site in 1982. And it's been sitting there. We've added on to it. The original cabin is still intact, a two-story cabin, log cabin. It's being dated by WVU right now. We added on to it with a meeting room and, a, and some uh, uh, meeting areas downstairs. So it is actually there on site too. All right, so we have living history, 
all over for the next day and a half. I encourage you uh, to get more of the stories, um, and particularly from the people who had an opportunity to meet Miss Buck in person. Um, take advantage of your other conference goers.